also was working at, at uh, companies like Alias and then with Microsoft. Um, but it was really uh, in 2007 when he, he published uh, this book, which is called uh, Sketching User Experiences, which doesn't quite want to come in with the blue screen. But it's if, um, if you have a chance to find a, a copy of it, it's a very invaluable book for all fields of design. And that's why I thought that Bill's talk would be so important today, because we're, we're working with computer sciences in the Faculty of Science and Technology, but also with other scientists, as well as, of course, the Center for Architecture. And Bill's work cuts across all of these areas. So without further ado, I'm going to just pass it right over to Bill. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Great. And um, yeah, I'm, if I was late, I, I had this down at 8.30, so. OK. <laughs> well, well, we're very glad you're here. Um, um, all right, so. Uh, Let's go. So uh, let's. Whoops, sure. Am I? Is that my? Is my screen sharing working at all? I think, let's... Kristen, we may have to make. Uh, there's a second Douglas McLeod in, and uh, we may have to make a. Uh, let's see if we can make him a co-host. Kristen, can you? Okay, uh, Bill, you should be able to share. Uh, now. All right. Okay. There's that little green button, the share screen button down at the bottom. I yeah, no, it's up. I've got, what are you seeing on your screen? Uh, okay, got it. Here we go. Let's there we are. Now it's starting. It's starting. Yes. Now we see your we, your slides. Wonderful. Okay. So we can uh, we can we can rock and roll. So um, first of all, it, <laughs> it's funny to meet this way, Doug. Um, uh, some part of electronics always gets in the way, or or if there's a mediator, I guess is a better way to say it. So um, first of all, I, I if there's a in the chat window if questions pop up since um it's harder for me to monitor if if say doug if you monitor that and if the things come up i'm i welcome interruptions okay and, and to make this interactive and if you want more detail along the way just ask and i'll make sure that we leave time um to uh um to to um questions so and i'll do my best there so we're talking about sketching um it's interesting one of the reasons i like hanging around with with doug and and actually the person who designed the book um, is an architect um and we'll touch on some of uh, his work uh there because i think that from my field of design which started off as the design of electronic musical instruments and morphed into uh interfaces in general um, on the musical side, the, the part that's kind of interesting is that, for example, the multi-touch screen that's on your iPhone and all these other things grew, um, uh, it, it didn't, it, its growth path, its evolution went right through uh, the studio where Doug used to be on a drum that I made for a percussionist in a group called Nexus, but also he played on Steve Reich. He's a hand drummer. and. Um, and it started off as a drum so that you could hit it with two hands and have it respond the way a hand drum because the skills that this percussionist had was drumming, not working a computer. And so I had to make the technology fit into his skills that he'd worked for years and become world-class at. And so there's these strange bedfellows and cross disciplines that really help inform uh, and things. And if you look around, you're gonna um, find more than enough opportunities for creativity. And that's what this is about, exploring um, the uh, creativity and the act of, uh, of producing things that are essential. Um, I, I wanna start though, to speak about something I really, uh, I wanna just set my cards on the table. And I absolutely am against sort of the great man theory of uh, invention, design, and the designer dressed in black, and the person who's just this hero. 
We live in a culture which is so driven by hero worship that it blinds us to what actually is going on and, and makes people who are fledging architects or designers aspire to something uh, that even the most world famous uh, designers cannot achieve. Um, and, and, and I'm gonna call it the Edison myth because he's the worst offender uh, in terms of um, a, taking credit, personal credit for everything that was done. And the main thing I would say is with something like 2000 patents, he is supposedly, um, uh, it, he, as the sole inventor, um, even on his most fundamental patent, namely the filament and the white incandescent light bulb that made that feasible, um, he wasn't the first one to do a uh, filament in a light bulb. He, and he wasn't even in the building or in, in this area when the people who actually did the work and made the discovery made it. And none of them are listed. He is sole inventor on everything. He didn't do that. He was a remarkable person, but he wasn't the sole inventor. And he was a great publicist and like Steve Jobs, he, in fact, he was the model for Steve Jobs. He was the first person to have a publicist to promote his brand of an individual of the great man. And, and, and I mean that man in the most sexist way possible at, at, in that time. And so I wanna put an, an, a frame everything I'm saying here in terms of alchemy, the notion of what too many people aspire to or have been led to believe is that there is this flash of genius. There's these great creative people and they were born with it. It's sort of like the, what spoiled Star Wars was in the first episode, in the fourth one made, where all of a sudden you realize that the force was genetic as opposed to something you built up inside. My, my son stopped watching Star Wars when he saw that because it ruined the entire story. Yes, the force is with you. And no, you don't get it by birth. You get it by, by, by practice. And it's the alchemist solution. You cannot make gold. You can't just manufacture it. it, it it's, it, it's there already. And the process, and this is by metaphor, the process of design is the most important part of it is prospecting, prospecting for problems, but also prospecting for solutions and observing what's going around. And if you can't prospect, you're, you're going to uh, be at the tail end. And, and there's all kinds of techniques and tools that you can use for that. But most of us, if we're on a, out canoeing in, in the north, north of Canada and you're walking across the Canadian Shield getting eaten by mosquitoes carrying a canoe, you don't even realize that you're walking over a diamond mine or a gold mine because you don't know how to prospect. And then the first thing you do then is say, hey, if I, if I care about mining that type of thing, then maybe I should invent the, uh, or, or find a, a Geiger counter if I'm looking for uranium just for ease. But that's not enough. You first of all have to prospect and find it. The next thing you have to do is you have to mine it. You have to figure out how to get it out of the earth and, and, and get the raw materials. And after that, you have to refine those materials in, in, in terms of uh, it, taking the gold and it's actually turning, uh, extracting all the other materials, trying not to completely destroy the earth in the process and, and, and actually start to make gold. And, but even then your job isn't finished. And, and this is the, the finer parts, the most visible part of design, but the part which is just the, the dessert, the, the, the icing on the cake is the goldsmithing where you make, you take the gold and by, by working it further, you make it worth more than its weight in gold. And, and it's really important to understand if you can't do all of these things or understand where all these things fit in the process and how they interrelate with all the other people, in the, in the process, then there's a challenge, it's a problem. So the process, design is a process, but the minute you get rid of this great man theory and you start to say that it's the, 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 the mining theory, then you can start to say, we can teach this, you can learn this. And like any conservatory of music, uh, let's say in Salzburg, you can become, because the infrastructure is there, all the learning tools are there to become a great musician if you put the work in. That doesn't mean you'll become Mozart, but Mozart will only emerge from, uh, from that infrastructure that was designed for people like you and me, normal people. And, and it's really critical because I, 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 it's really gets you down. And, and, and of course, then you have to figure out how to deliver that, that wonderful piece to the right market in the right way. All of those things for the product to exist in any meaningful way, as opposed to a piece of art and art it, design is not art. It's a practice. And so where does it fit in? Well, everywhere that 
that from the very beginning right through the very end, design is involved. And it's even designed in the design of the mining tools. It, it's recursive. And, and, and that means because it fits in in every stage of the process, and I don't care whether you're talking about architecture or the design of a new mouse um, or a new process, that, that you have to know everybody else's role in what it takes um, to bring that thing to market. It's a job and you have to know the stuff and we have to have the craft and learn it in a way. So if we're about to get divorced, the bank's gonna foreclose on our mortgage. Um, we're sick as hell. Uh, we hate our job. We hate our clients. Uh, we hate ourselves kind of, and we can still do the job because we can fall back on technique and process. And we don't have to rely on the muse. If you want to rely on the muse, then you might do some great work, but you should probably go become an artist and, and, and get a Canada Council grant as opposed to become a professional designer. And, and then they come down to this whole notion of sketching. So where does that fit in? And, and it's a really essential tool of design. I think it's fundamental to the design process, but even there, I think there's some confusions. For example, people confuse sketching with drawing. Um, so it's essential, but it's not sufficient. And we have to try and figure out where it fits into the larger process. And, and the most effective way for me to try and talk about it, or even when I'm talking to myself, is to keep reminding myself, it's not the artifact that it produces. It's what, it's the, it's the activity that it engenders. The sketch is, has an intent and the intent is to provoke and, and, and push you further. The sketch itself is a nice artifact to capture a snapshot of one of the steps, but it's the means, it's not the end. And so, yeah, it's a nice drawing, great, good on you. What ideas is express? Why should I care? Unless I'm looking to, at it as art. And so it comes down to divorce the process from the, from the material. The material can really make a sketch more effective, but not in the ways that most or many of us think about. And it's social. Uh, sketches are social, have social relationships with other sketches, those who would precede it, those who would follow it, but it's social in terms of the conversations that it's, it provokes. And in many ways, the whole process of sketching is to provoke conversations and to make us think and give us landmarks, reference points, so we don't get lost. They're like when you're uh, hiking in the wilderness, if you put down waypoints with your GPS, or whatever, so you don't, you don't quite get lost, or you can just sort of mark up the spots, but it's not the journey, that's not the route. And yes, it could be a try. And so, for example, um, this is a detail from the notebook of uh, time, uh, Te Te Tecola, and this is from the mid of, uh, middle of the 15th century. And this is, to the best of my knowledge, the first recorded use of sketching um, as opposed to drawing. So let's be clear, there used to be sketchbooks in architecture and there were pattern books. And this goes right, you know, Alexander, when he talks about pattern languages and so on in, in, in architecture, um, this has a really long history because before photography and everything else, people went out and they drew all these, um, especially the, the classic things. There were all these catalogs of like the Sears catalog or the Canadian Tire catalog or, or Lee Valley Tools catalog with all of the patterns uh, all of those little details and you would go through and you'd uh, pick this thing, that thing, and you put it together like Lego in terms of that those are some of the tools that's not what I'm talking about those are things to capture snapshots to set out a mosaic of materials that you can use just like a color palette it was a, a feature palette that that and the and you can pick different styles like different fonts um, that would let you make choices and that that, that was clearly part of a design process but those drawings with a very different intent. They were to capture, record, so you can, as a memory aid. Tocolas was the first one where he's working through ideas. And, and this is just about um, ways to protect boats, uh, ships in, in war, and different types of battlements. And the most important thing about this sketch, and I know it's big and fuzzy, but heck, it's from the middle of the, middle of the 15th century. Um, 
he had multiple solutions there. He's got a whole bunch of different ways to show the, um, to, to, to sketch out ideas and just capture them. And, and, and notice there's text in there to annotate. They're messy, they're just dirty, they're just, but they're, but he's working in multiples. He's really doing fast. And it's the number of ideas that, that captures the essence of sketching, not how they're articulated, other than the fact that they look like they're knocked off really quickly, which is an important aspect actually of, of what the sketch, sketching language was. And yes, it's on paper. And this is when we think about sketching, this is the um, kind of renderings that you would expect to see. Everybody would call that a sketch. They may not say when or when it was done or wh whatever, but they probably wouldn't talk, emphasize the point that it was multiples of the same idea, different variations. And that's the most critical thing. It's exploration um, to, to find out where, where things lie. But it doesn't have to be a drawing. This is a recreation that I made of uh, an early sketch of the Palm Pilot, which was uh, which kind of uh, was the predecessor to your iPhone um, or, or or whatever. Um, and and the Palm Pilot just was that everybody had one. It was a it was the first pen based uh, handheld that uh, called a PDA or, or or it was like a little handheld computer that had your address book and all this stuff in it. It was had a pen you could use your fingers. It did all kinds of really cool things, but the most important thing was it had to be handheld. And so literally the first prototype was go to the shop, get a block of wood, cut it so it'll fit in your pocket and will it fit in your hand? And what's it like to draw? And it's an experiential prototype because the whole thing was, it wasn't what it looked like. Oh, that was important. There's a secondary issue. Can it fit in your pocket? Can it be with you in the context where it's used? And will it fit in your hand? And what does it feel like? Can you actually write on it with a pen? What does it feel like? And if you can't feel it and experience it, then you're probably gonna get the design wrong, depending, um, and you have to do everything you can to figure out how you can actually experience it before you build it. That, that my rule is this, the only way to engineer the future tomorrow is to have lived in it yesterday. And Jimi Hendrix had it right when he said, as the philosopher of design is, they ask the fundamental question, are you experienced? If you don't have the experience, what have you got to draw on when you're trying to design experiences for others? And so the, this whole notion of, uh, of what a design team and design culture is about, is about the, not just the prospecting for ideas, but prospecting for the um, fields in which you can go and, and, uh, and find raw materials to prospect for. And, and it's a recursive again, it's, self, it's embedded. And you get uh, things like this. Um, and, and, and here's another form of acting out, which is what the previous one was for. So you act through it, trying to do it. This is a really, this is a, a world famous psycho, uh, sociologist. He taught me everything I know. Actually, Richard Harper, this guy here in this image, um, when I wrote the book and I gave him the manuscript, he made me throw something like 40% of the book away. And he said, you're saying things too many times. You've said them already. And the book is, he's the one who's so responsible. He's not a designer, but he's the most incredible book editor and author I've ever met. And I had to trust him because he knew more than me about my own field from the perspective of storytelling. But here's the deal. I was trying to talk about context. And as architects, you know that there's, you know, um, there's this whole thing, right? Uh, we shape our spaces and our spaces shape us. So um, the fundamental question is, what should the space be like? It says, what do I want to be like? Once I've built that space, how is it going to shape me? And what's appropriate behavior? What are the social mores? Um, what's the moral order of any particular place that you're, you're designing? And so I wanted to emphasize that it's not about the room. It's not about the meeting. It's not about anything. When he walked, I just said, hey, Richard, I want you to do something. And he looked at me and said, I'm working on the book. I said, I want, will you come to work tomorrow in your pajamas? Because I know you've got a meeting. You've got to present to it. And, and damn it, he did. And, I, and this, was, this is a stage. He came because I asked him. And because I asked him, and there's that, that respect and friendship. And he's a sociologist. Right, he's the one who taught me anything I know about sociology practically, and but he did come to the meeting, and I happened to I took my camera because I knew I, he told me he'd do it, and he did, and I I trusted him, so I did bring the camera. But the point is, you look at this, and this is just wrong. The moral order is wrong. You, you just don't do this, and yet if he was working, you know, it, it would be perfectly fine to be talking to in a different context in a different room. 
and there's a meaning in place and there's functions and 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 in some sense going to meetings if you're going to have something you're trying to make that point you can act it out that is a sketch and if you want to think of it it's sketch comedy in a way except it, because it is kind of funny and it's kind of neat because humor is a huge way to break the ice when you're trying to free up and if you want to be creative the point is how can you be creative if you've got to pickle up your butt and you're so uptight you, you're too afraid to move and and play with things playing with ideas is really really important and in fact Alex Manning, who, who teaches at OCAD U in, in, in Toronto, he said to me once, he said, the last thing you should do is draw a line. The minute you draw a line, you're already committing yourself to something. And it's all about play. And he's written books about that. And, I, and, and the point is this, you gotta be flexible in uh, what it is, what a design is. And so you just sort of say, well, well, well when, how, and what a rendering should, should say. And so here's, just to sort of like a timeline of the designs. This is from industrial design, but from uh, just early renderings of uh, of uh, a, a stroller and coming through, and you're getting arrows now coming in and functional. These are look. No, notice all the little on the left side. There's all these secondary things about uh, second ideas that come through. The refining, the renderings refining, and uh, and now you're starting to get a mechanical thing to show it. And here's now the 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 exploded view, and I can come into color studies and that before manufacturing. And the point about this is, notice the difference in rendering style, how tight, how loose, how tentative versus how, how, uh, how uh, let's, let's say uh, authoritarian they are, how I'm saying this dogmatic. These are starting to say, okay, this is it. And, and, and now we're gonna manufacture this if you don't tell me now, because this is where we've gotten to. But here's where we started. This just says, hey, you know what? This is what I've whipped out. Um, you, what do you what do you think and and so if we go along the timeline from left to right these are sketches these are prototypes um when you get over here to you get into blueprint types of things and, and now you're starting getting product renderings and one of the things there's, there's two things that happen as the rendering gets higher and higher fidelity the number of objects you make and the number of exemplars there are goes down. So quantity trumps quality in terms of rendering. But there's the two things that are, I think are really important. What underlies this is when I, I, I to, when I was preparing the book, I, I taught some courses fourth year and for first year master's uh, courses at, on design at, at OCAD. You would, and, and the first thing I say when I come into a class is say, I take marks off for good work. And the students are all trying to say, what, what are you talking about? No, no, I said, really, if you bring me really good work, I'm gonna fail you. And I don't care how good it is. The better it is, the more I'm gonna fail you. This is a class on sketching. And if you had time to do that one beautiful rendering, you had time to do 10 variations, meaningful distinct various versions because you have already committed to your first idea and just run with it. And you don't know what you didn't do because you don't know what you don't know because you haven't explored the space. And, and it's too expensive to go backwards once you've, you've committed down that path and you hit the brick wall and realize, crap, there was something else I could have done. So quantity goes down as you go forward and the quality of the renderings come up. But the critical thing in the way we have to think about this is that you need multiples, and we'll get more of that. That's a key part of sketching. But the rendering style, how you render, should never, ever convey a, a degree of confidence or commitment beyond where you are in the design process. And the reason I hate, even in my own industry and even in my own company, when they do these envisionment videos and things like that, trying to portray the future and future ideas, and they do it with the cinematics of vocabulary of a TV commercial, I think that's verging on dishonest because it's saying that makes it, if you use the language of product marketing to market an idea, I'm sorry, that's misleading because most people who see it are going to think you've already done this. And so many people you look on online that they'll put, hey, I invented this and make a, a 3D beautiful rendering. No, you didn't. That's, the, that's a trivial part of design. 
And this is the process. That's how you, this is how you get there. And this is where, and, and we'll talk a bit more about this, but again, the quantity and the quality. So let's talk about what I'm talking about. What, what makes a sketch a sketch? First, they have to be quick and timely. And even if you did spend a bunch of time on it, it has to look like that you didn't. It has to be, you have to be able to deliver right away and it has to look like it was right away. And you know why? Because I might wanna say, hey, get rid of it. And if you spent all night working on that one piece to make me your client, your boss, your colleague or whatever, uh, you're not gonna be happy because I'm criticizing you. So you gotta do it fast and they have to be inexpensive and disposable, or at least to whoever you're sharing them with, they have to appear that way. So that when I say, hey, no, not this one, but this one's pretty good at that one, because you've got multiples, I'm not attacking you because if you give me five different sketches, each one meaningfully distinct from each other, and you have not made a decision on your own, then I can come and say, hey, this one's, uh, you know, I like this one. I want to take part of that to part of that and put them together that way or, or whatever. But if I reject them, I'm not rejecting you because there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the work and the person. You haven't made up your mind. You're giving me the sketches there, not for you to teach me about, tell me what, tell me what to do, but rather it's there to let me contribute but also to express an honest opinion and do so without destroying our relationship. And, and by the way, don't confuse this with the other technique that designers use in marketing and architects use in buildings. We're gonna come in, hey, uh, to the client, I'm gonna give you three designs. Okay, here's the first one. And it's gonna be really, really expensive, right? And you've got the second one and it, it's, uh, it's minor and it only costs this much. And, you do the, and then you do the one in the, one in the middle. By the way, this is how artillery works as well. Um, and, and of course, what you're doing is to frame the one uh, you're trying to get approval on and you're advocating for. The other two are just um, sidesmen to try and uh, make you look good and, and to help channel the client's behavior. That is not sketching. Artillery is the same thing, right? You're in the trenches, bam, the enemy shoots a shell, explodes way behind you. Ha, 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 you can't, you can't shoot. They do another one, it lands in front of you. Ha, 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 you, 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 you can't shoot. No, no, they were just finding the range and the, due to the wind. The third one, that's when you duck. You, have, you don't have to duck in the first and the third of the second. But, that, but, but those types of multiples are not the same thing as sketching. Sketching is honest to God, you are indifferent as to which one because you can see the good and the bad of each sketch. There has to be lots of them to do this. Um, in fact, you know, what, what, what a, one of my colleagues who's uh, had a design at a, at a major a company that, that, whose products she used, basically if, if a designer comes in with less than five uh, uh, different concepts when they're in the early stages, you're fired. I mean, I mean you're not, you're not gonna, he's not a jerk, but, but, but essentially that's in, on it. In, but if you keep doing it, um, you're, you're gonna, not gonna get promoted. You're not gonna have a job. You have to have multiple ideas without prejudice as to which you want. And as I said before, the vocabulary that you express it have to express the intent and the, what the level of thinking is and the level of commitment. And there must be just enough uh, resolution uh, to communicate the intent no more. And this was hit for me by a car designer at, at one of the major at big three who's, uh, and, and he sort of said, you know, you do the sketch, it's all this sort of thing. It's just a rough concept. And you just, for details, you just painted the little part of it like the taillight red or, or some feature, just a little bit of color here. You know what's going to happen is the executive that's coming in is going to say, hey, why is that red? And you say, no, it doesn't matter. It's just a sketch. I'm just, it's, it's irrelevant. And, and, and they're going, no, no, I really want to know why it's red. And they keep going. And you're going to say that, and, and, and you're going to get frustrated and say, what an idiot. I'm just trying to show them the concept. No, you're the idiot. I'm the idiot if I do it. Because... If it doesn't need to be there, it shouldn't be there. You put it there, you had no real reason other than make it pretty, and it just was a diversion. And it's a little bit like DRMs, just enough detail is necessary and no more. And, and it's critical that we do this so that we can get to the essence, no distractions. 
And, and again, what I've said already, the resolution of the rendering must reflect the fidelity of the stage of thinking. And here's the one that maybe confuses people when I say, sketches must be ambiguous. You are not telling me in a sketch. You're provoking thought. And therefore, if it doesn't afford multiple interpretations, it's not gonna serve its purpose. And my favorite way to describe this is an effect of sketches like Swiss cheese. It must be full of holes. Um, and the reason is because uh, that leaves enough room for the imagination. I should get that back, right? So let's now come back to sort of saying, um, what's the difference between a sketch and a prototype? Because I've already said we can make physical sketches as well as um, uh, paper, ones on paper and drawings. There's all kinds of ways to sketch. Plasticine, uh, people make maquettes uh, in, in for animation and so on and so forth. Um, and I said before, it's about the purpose. And so on the left-hand side, these are the properties of a sketch. And, and on the right-hand side, uh, there's ones about prototypes. And be very, very clear, in my industry, for at least, within the design of um, any type of electronic uh, instrument or, or electronic device, and even mechanical devices, um, I often make prototypes out of paper because it's still faster, but they're operational and so on and so forth. At a certain point, they become, um, and, and I, 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 there's some examples in the book of a juicer, which I, I went through and did a full case study, but there's not time here today. But the sketch is to um, pr provide a catalyst for ideas, not to teach. It's to ask questions. It's to suggest, not to describe. It's to explore not to refine. It's to question, not answer. It's to propose, not test. It's to provoke, it's not to resolve. It's tentative, it's not specific. It's non-committable, non-committal. It, 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 it's not a depiction. It, but that left column, of course, is the first step or an early step on the way to teaching, describing, refining, answering, testing, resolving, being specific and being a, a, a depiction. But there is a path from those two extremes. And the whole port, point of the early phases of design is to make sure that when you, when you start off with a blank piece of paper and you get here to a very accurate description that you're committed to, that you not only get the design right, but you get the right design. And if you have not explored every possibility at every step on every decision along the way, you are probably gonna have the best product that's a failure. Beautifully engineered, gorgeous to look at, and it's a failure. And by the time you're halfway down the process, you find that out, it's too late. You can't go backwards and refactor and start again, you're, you're done. And the most important part is that the early phase of the project, that's when you have the lowest burn rate for your clients. That's when you have the time to experiment and take these chances. And so what you can by sketching, you can get way further down the process without going down that process because you're working at such a low level of fidelity that, that all you can see are the essential concepts. And some of those might be fine details. God is in the details, but, but it's really important to know the difference. And if there's a one word that defines design in my perspective, it's choice. And so this comes back to the notion of multiples. If you only have one thing, you have no choice. It's, 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 it's a done deal. And it's choice for the client, it's choice for you, it's choice for your colleagues, it's choice for the engineers, it's choice for the marketers, it's choice for the exact financial people. And the question is you have to set up and control the environments around to make intelligent choices. And so it's in, how do you inform? And, be, and, and so if you're going to choose, the most important thing about the design process is that make sure that you're not giving five choices of the same thing. And to, we, the sketching again is a way to tease out what are the meaningful distinctions that make things meaningfully different 
So there is a meaningful choice and one that we can evaluate its viability. And we have to understand that every choice and every design has a good side and a bad side. Nothing's neutral. Technology is not good, it's not bad, but nor is it neutral. And then the question is, what's your criteria for making uh, the choices? And so we're gonna get to that. But the most important thing here is to emphasize over and over and over is it's about multiples, but not just arbitrary multiples in quantity, but also in quality in terms of what the qualities are. What are the design values? They must be meaningfully distinct. And you have to figure out within your colleagues, what are the dimensions of differentiation that qualify to make them distinct? But there absolutely is no room for only one solution to just do this and say, okay, let's build it. And, and because you might get lucky, you might be a one hit wonder, but you cannot repeat it. You will not be able to do that when you're hungover, depressed, and, and the banks for closing. Richard Sewell, he used to um, head up design at, at Sheridan College, who I worked with a lot. He founded one of the top print stu making studios in, in Canada uh, called Open Studio. And, and he just sort of said, I cannot do crit on a single piece of work. Because if I criticize the work and there's only one piece, I'm criticizing you. I've already said this. Multiples are important there for many reasons. A, they like to explore multiple ideas. But this part emphasizes it also changes the social dynamic within the design team from one of hostility and causing resentments to one of saying, wow, you're super creative. You did all these different things. You did them really quickly. That's fantastic. What a great designer because I've, I've learned a lot. And by the way, the thing we're gonna do is not any of the ones you did, but with where we landed was directly because of you did those ones. You maybe shut all the other doors that led us to another door. Um, it doesn't matter. It's a team sport. So there's two places to exercise creativity in design. And by the way, I have this operational definition of creativity. And, and for me, creativity is the act of making the obvious obvious before it's obvious. If you get it right, it's going to be simple. People are going to say, hey, <laughs> that was obvious. Yeah, but it wasn't beforehand. And how do you make it obvious? Because then when you've got something that in retrospect is obvious, but it wasn't but was hidden in plain view. And you're the one who had the optics to see the, the potential there. That's gonna be a really, a, 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 a really successful product if, if, if that's in fact what happened. And there was a need for the thing in the first place. But the two places are the creativity that you bring to enumerating the set of meaningfully distinct things uh, from which you choose. So, it's not just multiples, it's which multiples, what are the candidates that you nominated for consideration, you nominated to be explored? And how did you get them? What's your process? Um, how diverse are they? How can you convince me that they're not just variations on the same theme at the micro level when you should be going much broader? What are you drawing on? And this is where Jimi Hendrix comes in again. What, <laughs> if you're not experienced, the pool from which you can draw, the ocean in which you can fish is much, much smaller. And I don't mean that just as an individual. This is the social part of design again. It's amongst your design, fellow designers and, and your collective experience. And that's why you never hire somebody who's like you. You've already got the best one in the world. Um, you. The only people to work with are people who are different than you, have different skills. And, and, and then together, you, you work together. It's what I call a Renaissance team, right? There was never a Renaissance man or woman. If there was Leonardo and Michelangelo, didn't need the Medici, why didn't they do their own banking? If they knew everything, they could do everything. No, everybody needs complementary skills to be successful. And the enumeration of many, the set to draw on is directly correlated to the experience of the collection of the people who are trying to uh, uh, work on the concept. And the second thing is once you've, made those choices, how do you, I'm um, sorry, once you've, you've, been, you've done the enumeration, the expansion side, how do you then narrow it down and filter? And I wanna be very, very, very clear. And this is the fundamental part of the process that cannot be violated or you completely destroy the culture of the design team and people will leave. And that is this, in phase one, 
you'll be sent into the corner if you reject any idea or you criticize an idea. All you can do, and it's a given in the culture, and this is what every designer has to, to enforce and discipline themselves, or else because it, uh, anyone can destroy the culture, just one person. And so it's a responsibility. You can enumerate the negative and positive aspects of any idea. Hey, this is great. It's got these problems, but, but, it's, but on the other hand, it's really good here. Everything's best for something, worse for something else. Just take that as a, as a, tr a, a truth. Mark those things down as you enumerate things. But if anybody advocates for the adoption of a design at this stage or rejects it and says, that's a stupid idea, then why is it even here? Uh, if Take them aside if you care about them and try and help modify the behavior before it destroys your team. Because the decision-making, the refining comes after you've got a full palette. You start to sort things. You see them categorized and you'll start to cluster. That's why you have these big boards and mood boards and you spread things around. And that's a social aspect of, of the process. And now you're starting to see the patterns. You're starting to see things about where this relates to that and how does it relate to the other problems because we've got other problems because there's a whole different parts of the project. And then you can start to make a holistic view because you've got an overview of the whole thing before you make those decisions prematurely. And now the second place of creativity is the creativity you bring to the criteria, the heuristics, according to which you make decisions. Now you can start to do the evaluation because you've all got agreement on what the things are and how they relate, or consensus or an agreement to disagree even, but, but then you start to do that. And these are separate phases. They have very different social uh, protocols in terms of how you behave and what your purpose is. And if you do not make a clear line between the two, it's gonna fail. It's, or uh, it, it's gonna for, fail more often than it needs to. So here's the enumeration. This is great. I'm a designer, I come here, the world's my oyster. I can do anything I want. I'm just gonna fill up this cone, a funnel, it's gonna just get here and I've got all these ideas. This is, oh, wow, this is great. I'm creating things, wow, 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 this is really great. Isn't design a wonderful creative thing? It's so positive. Huh. No, it isn't. It's the most negative thing in the world. You start off with a million things once you get into the refinement thing and you only that up. So almost every idea is gonna be rejected. And, so, and, and most of them are going to be yours, probably. It was small. Something you contributed to came out there. But no, you contributed to all of them by the virtue of going through this process. Everybody owns the final design, no matter where the, that particular thing came, because you contributed to showing that it was the right thing. And, and of course, these things can overlap. They're going on at the same time. And so there's these little cycles going all through the process that that... Um, you start off with the big problems that define the whole architecture. And then the, as you go re refining, the class of problems happen, they're, they're smaller, but they, they still are, are moving. And so it's sort of like this. We, we enumerate here on the principal things. And so we start to refine, but when we get to here, we get the next order of problems. And so then we go up here and now we get those, we come down. So the level of problems come and we go down like that. So it's like this kind of structure of enumeration of that, but each, it's for each class of problems. So it's an iterative thing, but let's be very clear. The decisions we made here, they have to hold through right to there. And, and there's gotta be a really good reason you backtrack and rethink. And that's really, really expensive. At, at, at Microsoft, listen, if I want to change something in an operating system and something like that, there's 3,000 programmers working on that one design. 3,000. And that's not including the designers. Those are just the engineers. Backtracking, once you've invested a, a couple man centuries or person centuries in the project is kind of expensive. That's why at the early stages of design, you've got a group of, you know, Let's say whether it's uh, 10 or 30, or in some cases, 100 people working on that on the early stages. That's way fewer, and it's easier to backtrack and, re and revise when at that early stage than it is when you've got 3,000 as opposed to uh, three or 30 or even 300. 
I'll give you an example about design. So since you're architectures, I, I love architecture. I love architecture for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I had people like Doug, uh, you know, pushing this stuff because it, it's just a great thing of design. But I think that this is the this is a Seattle Public Library. It was done by OMA. Um, Josh Prince Ramos was the architect, but it, it, it's Rem Coolhouse's company, and um, and. I wanted because it was a Microsoft. I was working at Microsoft at the time. I wanted I did, just did a, anatomy the, again. The the, um, the the person who Henry Chung who designed the sketching book actually did all the interior graphics and the wayfinding in this building for for Josh. And so we spent some time with Josh uh, in New York. I went down just to to try and talk about this because it's a project that's on a scale of the things that we do in software and and. and and so there's a timeline here that I think is really important. So the call for proposals was in November 1998. Um, the building opened in July 2004. Um, the contract was awarded in May 1999. And the construction began in 2002. And, uh, and again, you see where it's opened. Now, what is kind of interesting is that um, the award was given here. Um, the thing that um, already by uh, this, they had this um, model done and it's clearly uh, capturing uh, the, what the eventual building, but you could sort of say, hey, the design's done. And, and if as architects, you'll know, you'll see the model say, hey, you've already done the design, what, so what? Well, no, you haven't. You've defined sort of the form that all the, <laughs> Uh, you know, where's the plumbing? Where's the where's the power? Where, where's how are the floors laid out? You know, and so on and so forth. But the thing is, this is. But most people who aren't designers and say, "Hey, you've already that's the design." No, it's not. It's a representation of the form, and nothing to do with the experience. And and what I find interesting is the construction starting here. It goes that long, but the design cycle started there and what's critical is the design not the, not the finished thing the design wasn't finished till after the building had opened because you because no matter with 3d graphics and everything else the even the most visionary architects whether it's frank gary or rem Coolhouse or anybody um when they're walking through they cannot fully visualize what's appropriate and those fine level of details to tune the building until they can actually walk through it in a near finished state, no matter how great their imagination is. And so they're going to be making those detailed changes after the building's even been delivered. And, and the same thing's true in software. And by the way, what nobody pays attention to in my world is the fact that there's a whole other architecture firm hired to write the brief, the design brief and the proposals. That, that in taking on that job, they weren't allowed to bid on the contract. So that it is architects who were deeply involved in setting and preparing the call. Design fits in all, th all of these stages and in every, every one of them at every stage and every class of problem, sketching is part of the process. So let's just remind ourselves that this is clearly an architectural sketch. And by the way, this is another product that architects do. And most people don't, they think, oh, that's kind of the, this, no, no, this is the key part. This is the meat and potatoes. This is the stuff inside that model. That's what sort of got the model going. But even there, there was some vague notions here. But this says we're down to the point where we're starting to do blueprints to build. This is definitely not something you'd give to build. So let's talk about filling the funnel. You got to work fast. You got to enumerate, not adjudicate. You have to take marks off for good work. You have to be playful so that you don't care. You're not getting all uptight about things. And there's a process called 10 by 10. So you just get small groups, you each come out, you take an idea, you do 10 versions, and then you take, but you have multiple people, you, um, and you, you just start to build these things up and you, you, you break into small groups and each one does a few. Maybe you can't come up with 10 ideas, but you can come up with two. So get five people, now you've got 10, or you, you can work like that. You must have multiples, they must be different, and you must have a divergent views. And so having one editorial viewpoint from the beginning is going to constrain the design. Um, and, and, and I'm not gonna go through this. There's a workbook that goes, that's even much cheaper than the book that, that 
that Doug showed that, that goes through exercises of how to do this stuff. It's online, um, there's the tutorials and that sort of stuff. So I'm not gonna go through that. There's just not enough time. But I wanna, but what I want to get to are some things that aren't in the book and weren't there that, that subsequently, if I ever was going to, and I'm not, do a revision, um, what I would state differently. And the main thing was, I keep talking about, um, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix and the, the art experienced and that, that says, what are your references and stuff like that. And I, I talked about the inherent nature of designers to be collectors and get all these reference objects and have them around. And I realized, and, and it, it, I, I can't tell you how um, blind I am about certain things. It's really important to be self-critical and reflective because you can learn. Um, the Marcel Proust, the French uh, author, philosopher, had this great um, statement. He says, um, the only true voyage of discovery is not to go to different places, but to see through different eyes. And as designers, that's our job. When I say the creativity is making the obvious obvious before it's obvious, how do you do that? You get different eyes. You train yourself to become an optician. You figure out different lenses in which to view things. Where do you find those lenses? By looking around, what are the lenses of other people? When people say something and you say, wow, I never thought about that. I never saw that. No, no, what you should then the next step was see, I, I, wow, that's really neat. I didn't see that. Why didn't I see that? The next question, how did you see that? What is it in you and your training that gave you that insight? Remember I said it's, it's, it's prospecting? It's prospecting for lenses as well as it is for the things that lenses reveal. And, 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 and so I like Marcel Duchamp and I, did this in 1913, it's ready made. He made art, Picasso did the same thing. He took a bicycle seat, some handlebars and made a sculpture of a bull on the wall. This taking found objects and making things. And I didn't realize, because I just talked about these things as reference objects that inform design, but no, these are a material form of sketching. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. These ready-mades are simply things you found, found reference objects, and that you can use when appropriate to inform the design. And, they're, and that's a very, and they are really quick. They're right there, make use of them. They're a different material, but that is still a sketch. So I had this, um, Doug mentioned I had this background in music and this is me back in the day, somewhere around 1972 or 73. There's a bunch of pretty interesting synthesizers in the studio that I worked in and helped build. All of these instruments synthesized sound. These sine waves and different things and then you could modify what you synthesized. But then along came this device and it was called a sampler. Instead of synthesizing sounds, you basically went out uh, and, and with a microphone, recorded it and put it on the keyboard, and then you could just call it back and, and process it. That's called a sampler. Now, in a way, all the sketches that I've talked about so far have been synthesized sketches. And what I missed, despite this background, and even having that vocabulary, synthesizers and samplers, and, and understand completely the difference and the and difference in purpose and the difference in value. And when it never occurred to me that by going up with found objects like ready mades, I was actually sketching. And the sketching process was the curation of the things I found interesting and collected. And by the way, I now have over 800. Um, devices and objects that inform my design practice around um, the, the digital devices that we use, which I'm now curating to give away to a museum, but uh, probably to Cooper Hewitt in New York. But the key thing is um, this notion of sampling explains the whole compulsion that most designers have about collecting. It is a form of sketching. All of the things, my whole collection started because the fastest way to convey an idea is I went and found something. Here's an example. These are 
four of the somewhere around 40 smartwatches I have in my collection. And I would put all of these on my wrist because I, because I wanted to, this is when the iPhone had first come out with touch screens. I'd already been working on touch screens for some like 10 years before that happened. Um, and everybody was talking about touch interfaces. And I wanted to make a point because I really do not like fuzzy thinking, but I've got to train, help train people not to think in that fuzzy way and don't follow what the press or some idiots say just because it's said loud, it doesn't make it true. We know that from politics. Three of these watches have touch screens. Um, three of them are calculator watches. And I would suggest to you that you know that this watch is a calculator watch. And furthermore, you know that because the keypads are calculator keys and there's mechanical keys to enter the numbers and there's where you see the results. That I can expect. And by the way, this is the watch that does not have a touch screen. This watch is a calculator watch from the same manufacturer. And unless you uh, were fooling around, you would never know that it's a calculator watch because there's no keys. Because the, the only reason you'd know is there's a divide sign, multiply sign, and a minus sign and a plus sign here. But the key thing is, you have to enter the numbers by pushing and use a touch screen. It's a soft keyboard, rather hard, but that compromises the amount of space for the numbers on the screen. But it means you don't have all those little buttons and it's, but still, the, they're not mechanical buttons. You got these little touch things, your fingers are fat and it, it, it's awkward to type on, but it works. And it has a touch screen, you can't tell. Now this one's even more interesting because it's got a tiny little screen up here. It is also a calculator watch. It has a button on the side here that turns on the touch screen. That's the same, it's the same place on this one as well. But there's no place to have a graphical keyboard. How the hell are you supposed to put the numbers in? Well, what, you know what? You can put them in way faster and way better than any of the other, the, the other two calculator watches. Because what you do is you just write on the surface and you just write one plus two equals the number comes up on the screen up there because it just lets you print like you learned how to print in kindergarten. And you can do that when you're walking around, you can do it with your finger and you can write large because you write each letter on top of the previous one or each number on top of it. And you do the same thing in terms of the operators, the plus sign, the minus sign, the divide sign. And by the way, this watch with a touchscreen that had gesture recognition was released in 1984 for $99. And it had a battery that lasted for um, over a year. This watch has a touchscreen. It isn't a calculator, um, but it lets you um, switch modes from an altimeter uh, to a, a thermometer to alarms and to, to control the compass and the chronometer. You can do all these types of things on it. Completely different function. You will never figure this one out. Although it's one of my favorite watches. It's one I wear a lot. So the point is, if you talk about touchscreens, these three have a lot in common. If you talk about calculators, this one, this one, and this one. But let me tell you, if somebody talks to you about a touchscreen interface, just try to educate them. Because this touchscreen, if you know how to use it, teaches you nothing about how to use this touchscreen or this touchscreen. Knowing how to use any one of these touchscreen watches does not help you learn, use any of the other two. The only two watches that where the skills transfer are this keyboard here and the keyboard there. And if you know to turn on the keyboard, these two watches teach each other. So they, use a, they have a common design language, even if the, it's a different dialect. The keyboard is the language, the, the mechanical means of execution is dialect. Um, the fact I'm using touch on these three, you know, it's neat, but they're night and day each, or except there's only, there's more than night and day. There's, there's, there's three primary colors um, here in terms of the use and conceptually. And I can put those on my watch and I can give that 
to Steve Ballmer, who's the CEO of Microsoft at the time, I can have those on and the space of going up four floors, I can give them a quick summary of that talk right in front of them with existing products that I just bought on eBay. And if that doesn't meet the criteria of, of a sketch, I don't know what does. That saves a huge amount of time. So here's the point that I wanna make about design and design education. I gotta tell you that architecture is way better at this than uh, the fields of, of uh, human computer interaction and HCI and that sort of stuff, where it is by, the, <laughs> it's pathetic, which is partially why I'm getting this collection so that there's no excuse anymore to be pathetic. Okay, here's the timeline along here. Um, here's the past, here's now, and here's the future to the right, as you go left to right. Now, um, here's the history of concept A, and it follows a trajectory graphically represented as that. Now, I would like you to just use your imagination. Where's this gonna go in the future? If you had to extend this line, how would you do so? I would say something like that would be the typical answer you get. Now that is not where the future is gonna be, but you can imagine that by the law of inertia and hysteresis, that it's going to be sort of in that neighborhood. You've at least got a, a, a compass point to which you that you can deviate from, but you kind of know the axis that it's uh, that it's on, barring you know nuclear war or something. And likewise, if I do this line, and I could do this with a three-year-old, they will um, draw something like that for the same reasons. They'll extrapolate from what happened before to what's going forward. And because one of the things you want to do, people talk about disruptive design. Well, let's be very clear. Disruption is really expensive. You better be very careful about the, the benefit of that cost of that disruption is, is, is worthwhile. Um, many companies have failed by trying to be disruptive without understanding the nature of the process of being disruptive and how to design for that itself. And again, we come along here and it's gonna extend like that. Very different designs, different approaches, different trajectories um, and, and different pro projections, but you got something to work with. So here's the trick and, and you can do this with clients. Extend that line because a line is just a sequence of points and one is a sequence of one, it's still a sequence. You cannot extrapolate from a point. Every direction is the right direction or there's no direction. And the point I'm trying to make here is precisely that why multiples are important but, and sampling is important because you can only sample things that are already there. That means there is a history. There's something you can draw on and coming back to patterns like Alexander's patterns and others, there are patterns of design in whatever field you're designing for that are kind of like this, from which if you're trying to fill the hopper, you can start to look at the past and say, what's been in the hopper before? And where did it go? And now let's work there and use that not to follow, but at least to contrast, do the opposite and all these other de bono type of things about uh, thinking. But, but this dot puts to a lie the notion of, of, the, 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 of, the, of the nature of creativity that is harnessed on the great man theory, the Edison. Be clear, if you go through the lab books, he and his lab were building on the shoulders of giants. And this, so here's the deal. It's not about great invention. Everything we do, every success we have is due to being able to stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And the people who don't even know the shoulders are there are the ones that are crappy designers or lucky and they can't repeat it. And so part of the curation process, which is part of the prospecting, is to whose shoulders should we be standing on. And the most important and wonderful recognition we can have at the end of our careers is not that we invented something, but that our shoulders are worth someone else's standing on. And so the curation and the prospecting is about whose work you're building upon. And so this leads us to um, uh, just the next um, point. And of course, you got to be ready to, to be wrong, but it's a start. 
to this is called the long nose theory that you know somewhere around two certainly after writing the book i wrote an article that would kind of I, I I actually stole this graphic from the long tail from Chris Anderson. I just flipped it around because that's what I tend to do. I make bad puns all the time. And I just pointed out that if I looked at the literature of invention and design, is it from the time an idea came to the time it reached a billion dollar industry, it was almost always at least 20 years. There are no new ideas. Um, most of those ideas are below the radar. That's why nobody's aware of them. Um, and uh, so we were doing in my group capacitive multi-touch in 1984. It wasn't until 2007 that, my, uh, that the iPhone came out and, and Microsoft Surface came out with that. So that's when multi-touch started to happen. It took that long. It was just sitting there waiting for anybody to stick their head below the radar. Multiple companies did and they failed because they didn't know how to use it. But, they, but it was there for the picking. Almost everything is like that. If you go through the National Academy of Science and others and look at the data, um, everything in our world today has had at least a 20. The mouse was invented, so to speak, in 1965. It wasn't that Macintosh came out in 1984 with one. That was two years after Microsoft and Apple had also um, launched mice, but nobody knew about them. And and in actually 1968, there was a commercial mouse in, in um, Germany that nobody knew about, but it wasn't until Windows 95, fully 30 years. And by the way, I used to mouse for the first time as a musician in 1971 at the National Research of Canada because they built an animation and computer music system that used a mouse and nobody knew about it. Think about that, 71, and they'd had the mouse in 69, 71. 84 is when the Macintosh came out. And it wasn't until Windows 95 that everybody had one. It, nothing. We, here's the deal. Anything that's gonna be a billion dollar industry in the next five years is already at least 15 years old. And, and so you have to know the history, but the, if you wanna talk about mining, man, this is the space you mine. You mine the past because just like I mine it for those watches, but you gotta know how to prospect. But there's a very fine distinction between riffing off and ripping off. And so, no, we're not plagiarizing. I can look at Johnny Ives' work, uh, one of the most influential industrial designers in the last 50 years at Apple, the work he's done. I can tell you where his ideas came from because he's a scholar. He really did his homework. He knows the history well, and, and he knew whose shoulders to stand on. Most people don't see that. And they just think, oh, he's a genius. No. And then they try to do Johnny Ive without doing the homework and knowing the history and they can't and they fail because they're trying to do something Johnny Ive couldn't do either. Neither could I, because they don't know how important it is to, 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 to recognize a giant, much less choose which one you want and, and, and why. So this is slack line. So this, this thing from climbing and that, you know, you're walking across these canyons and doing these silly things, but you're out there on, on, a, on, a, on a loop. And, and what's important about this is that you could sort of say, you must be insane to do something like that. Well, I'll put it to you this way. Every one of you must be insane to be a designer. But I'd also say, thank God for that insanity because the world needs insane people of your particular <laughs> demented, demented state that your parents let you go to school or you're putting yourself to school to become a designer. God, we have never needed designers more than we need them now. But understand, you're taking on an extreme sport that makes that going. So I want to tell you, because I do some of this stuff, because I'm curating my own experience to learn how to deal with risk. And i got to tell you, I'm going to show you right now the difference between risk and danger. They're two very different things. Yeah, that's me. I'm climbing up a, a frozen waterfall in the Ghost Valley and just outside of Banff. Most people, if you haven't broken up in Canada, it's a dangerous thing to just walk across a frozen lake that's horizontalized. Think about it's suicidal if you're gonna try to go up vertical ice. But no, I could probably take, I, I wouldn't do it because I'm not qualified, but I have friends that could take you out and in a weekend you could be doing that. So what do you need when you go into a dangerous sport? The extreme sport, like compared to ice climbing, design is way more dangerous if you don't know how to do it. The risk of failure, Colossal failure and crashing and burning is really high. So how you and so how do you deal with it? First, you got to figure out you got to get the right skills. And the next thing is, um, 
having had the right skills, um, you have to have um, the right fitness. You need to be trained. You have to practice. You don't come out of the gate running full speed. And you have to have the right tools. And again, that sort of says, well, what is the right fitness? How do I train? What tools? What are the required tools? Every one of these things is a room where you need to design and you need to sketch. You can use your design skills, the fundamentals that we're talking about, to figure out, enumerate, and be creative about what skills are required that you might be that other people don't. Invent the Geiger counter. The fitness, new training way, new tools, and most important, who are your partners? And if you have the right skills, fitness, tools, and partners, you can turn something which is uh, would be suicidal for somebody without those to something which is uh, much safer than riding a bicycle down the, the streets of Toronto. But the most dangerous thing is to take no risk. That will kill you because the, it'll be sure death, but a long, slow atrophy. And so confront it, deal with it, and build rather than fade away. And so there's a couple of things about the design of the team. First thing is, listen, be very clear. There are no geniuses. The dirty little secret of highly accomplished people who seem to be superstars is what they've had to neglect in order to become highly accomplished. So when we see them, they're so brilliant and that you are like the deer in the head, proverbial headlights. All you can see is this brilliance because you're blinded by it. And what you can't see, there's nothing in the shadows because they, to get that brilliant, it's a full-time job and they've had to neglect things that everyone else would take for granted. Don't be fooled. And the people to stay away from are the ones who believe that their brilliance is full 360. And, and when you are hiring, it's critical that people are aware of their weaknesses and, and, and welcome someone else filling in the gaps as opposed to feeling like you're threatening them. The smarter I am at what I do, the more I have to acknowledge my ignorance in other areas and my dependence upon others. And that's fundamental to the design studio, mutual respect, so on. So let's put it this way. You've seen these T-shaped people, and this is how you construct a team because this is the most important thing in design other than perhaps the process. So we've heard about this, but this is a different way to take it. This is the breadth of your experience. Um, this is the depth of your expertise. To be very clear, there's a difference between literacy, which is a, a shallow depth, versus the expertise, which encompasses literacy and down like so. Every person you hire and you work with, you want to have this type of thing. They're really deep. And they have to be deep because the problems you're dealing with now are incredibly complex and require deep, deep expertise. You can't be superficial. But, that, but because of that, you're so deep you don't have the breadth to deal with the real, the whole problem. So you need others. So if you're the experienced designer, you need somebody who's got the same profile, but in a different uh, depth, depth in a different area in business and in technology. And, um, and, and, and you know, at Stanford now and so on, this is the stuff that, that, that T, I didn't deal with T stuff. I just started to do it, this type of animation, but it's this BXT, model, which is what we practice and the Stanford does at the design school. Because if you take these people and you form a team, notice what you've got. You've got, you've got a breadth now sufficient if you chose the right people and you know the tech skills that are required that you put together for your team, again, coming back to the ice climbing, but, you, but, but these overlapping parts of literacy give you a common ground so you can respect and have some, enough understanding of each other's sport and understand that there's a difference in expertise and, 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 and literacy. And if we just wrap this around, you'll see that it now becomes all, all encompassing. You have to design the team for the project and the skills that are required because you have to you need the best expertise. And this is why you, your teams need to be floating. And, but, you, but the fundamental thing here is because we're littered about each other's work, we have respect and we respect them and their expertise. And each person has the final vote and the deciding vote on any issue within their domain, modulo the person who's um, bankrolling the thing. They, they get to, to uh, have a say as well. And so this basically comes down to this notion that, that of what I've said before, that is that um, the Renaissance is over, uh, but long live a Renaissance. 
And then one other thing about this in terms of just to go this is that um, there used to be this prejudice against what people call I-shaped people because they're too narrow and just they're just not bad. But no, no, that's not that. I got a different version because the I-shaped person is also a T-shaped person, but in a different way. But it has to be an I-shaped person with a serif font because here I've got I've got um, skills here in, uh, in at the level of conceptual thinking and down here in terms of the sense of materials and practical stuff. And what you need, I, from my perspective. Is, is you need to cultivate a deep sense of the, the mud, the, the dirt and grime and the clay, the metal, the welding, the, the, the glasses, the markers and paper, all this foam core. You need to have a strong sense of materials at the ground level. So your feet are down in that mud and, and have your head in the clouds working at the conceptual so you can actually go to abstractions. And the thing that I find the most successful people are in design are the ones who have the ability to take things to abstraction and can think abstractly and find the high order issues while at the same time having comfort down in the mud and have your feet in the mud, head in the clouds and be comfortable walking. And if you find yourself and you talk to each other about, about how you work that way, um, if you see somebody who can really think conceptually and bump things up to the right level of abstraction that you can actually make the problem manageable, talk to them, learn how they do that, practice that. If you're, if you're, and, 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 the, and they're probably sometimes not as good down on the material side. This is where we are mutually support. And this is where we build up literacy in these parts so that we can complement each other in the design team. And I'm just going to finish up here by just saying, how deep does this go? Um, listen. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful products I've ever had anything at all to do with, and I'd had very little with this one. But this is a Surface too. This is this is a you know a, a, a computer that that is a designer's dream. It works. It's it's just it's just a a, a nice piece of work. Um, it's not. I'm not saying anything against Apple or anybody else. It just happens to be. I love this particular device. It's my favorite computer that I use. But all of the things I talked about. Lead, can lead to, to this. Uh, if you're interested in industrial design, the hinges on these things are just crazy. But, but it also extends up to architecture. Everything I'm talking about could fit into this house or any other house you'd like to find. So we can move from the industrial design, the objects in the house and the software inside those objects maybe, to the house itself. But what's important about today is that the problems are changing and they're moving and they now have to incorporate into this case of from the house, um, uh, you have to go up in this hierarchy to the city. And so we need to be literate in the equivalent by analogy of urban planning. You, it's not enough to be an architect. Who cares how beautiful your house is if you're in a, a, a context which is socially or uh, ecologically a disaster? And the most important challenge all of us have today is around how do we think ecologically from the micro level to the macro level and try and find a way to do within our power incremental positive steps. And, and that's where the deepest level of design and most impactful level of design in the long term. And we can't do that alone, either in terms of our individual projects, but in terms of the larger ecology. But we can at least take that as a principle and not just do clever, smart things. God prevent me from do dads. We have to think systematically. And that again affects the composition of the team and the clients we choose and how we actually train our clients in the same way that clients train us. And um, I guess this is the thing. Um, when I started saying the computer side of things and the tools, the real thing was, my God, could we actually make this work and not have a crash? Word processors didn't work, nothing worked. And, and people would buy the stuff. No, no, those days are gone. Today, essentially, we can do anything we think about, anything we dream of. And I prefer for me not to be trying to send two or some rich people up into space and rock. It's like facing real fundamental problems and, and at, 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 at all levels. And what I've tried to say with this going from the object to the ecosystem through the house and everything else, the tools and the skills that we've talked about in terms of design will apply at every level of this. And furthermore, vertically as well as horizontally. And, and 
And so it doesn't matter what field of design, it's the practice and the process you've learned to make yourself a, a, a master craftsman, if not even, uh, if, 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 or even a journeyman in this, in this, in this, in this field. And, um, and I just say this, is that evolution and, and things evolving in technology and society and so on, that's just a scientific concept. This guy McCarver, he's a sociologist, he made this lovely comment. He says, progress, um, evolution is a scientific concept. Progress um, is an, um, that's a spelling table for me. Progress is an ethical one. And, and every decision we make, this is the final thing to say, this is sort of technology, he's one of my heroes, his name's Melvin Kranzberg. He said, technology is not good. It's not bad, but nor is it neutral. It will be some combination of the two. Every decision you make, every decision is an ethical decision. And the fundamental question is this, are you even aware of the fact? And then even more, are you aware to know how to do the triage and make the decisions necessary to err on the side of the positive um, and as, a, as opposed to bias to the negative and be aware of what the weaknesses are. Um, if you don't do that, you could be Facebook and, and see what happened because they said, oh, what could happen? We'll fix it. If it breaks, we'll fix it. No. The errors there were errors of design that were known in advance. They could have been avoided and they sacrificed that for greed or for, for the growth. And it's, it's fundamental here that we have to start thinking these ways and taking those responsibilities and understand that um, it's not a bad job if you can actually make a difference against the things that, um, that are, are happening right now. German uh, actor had this great thing. He said, the Zukunft war früher auch besser. The future is better in the past as well. Well, how'd that turn out for you? His name was Carl Valentine. No, no, I'll, I'll, I will actually want to make the future better in, in terms of progress, not in terms of change. And I think with these skills, I think you're early in your careers, um, you, you got the ball to carry, and I hope this helps pass it on. With that, I'll take questions. If we've got a bit of time. I think we've got about 15 minutes that we could spend um, if you have questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm, I am monitoring the chat as well, but if anybody wants to um, unmute their microphone and ask Bill a question, uh, please go ahead. We being Canadians, we're always a little bit shy about asking the first question. So um, I'll, I'll quickly ask, I'm sorry to ask this one, but that synthesizer that you were working on when you were oh so young, what was that? Well, oh, you know what? I, I can go back because uh, why wouldn't I? Um, because I somehow, it's just so uh, much a part of, um, This is just a quick review to trigger your mind as to what the, what the questions you wanted to ask, which forgot. There we go. Okay, so yeah, so that's me in 1972, I believe, um, 72, 73, before I went to the Netherlands. So this synthesizer is called an ARP 2500. And it didn't use patch cards. These cherry switches let you make connections within it. And these are all different synthesizer modules. So it's, it's a monophonic keyboard and it's pretty sweet. This is the marvel. This is a Canadian thing that- um, Bill, we can't, we can't see your screen. Um, oh, you can't. Oh, that's, oh, because no, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, thank you. Now, start again. This is an ARP 2500. It is, I, I would still love to have one of these because, but you could only play one note at a time, but it was an analog synthesizer. You get all kinds of sound generators and they could process the sounds and filters and do all kinds of uh, things on it. Um, it was a huge thing. Um, you can now get a, an app for your Macintosh or your PC that would emulate it exactly. This thing on my left hand is actually the part that is a tragic story in some sense of design. It's got the best, all the best and all the worst. It's called a, a sackbut. It 
um, if you knew anything about a, a mini Moog, um, it, it came out before the mini Moog. Bob Moog was a friend of mine. Uh, so no slagging off there at all. He was brilliant. I learned a lot from him, but it's a single uh, keyboard. But this is the person who designed this is the person who taught me about capacitive touch at the National Research Council of Canada when I was up there working on a computer music system doing my first time I ever saw a computer. I was doing the soundtrack for, for a, 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 a film. Uh, what's a sackbut was an old kind of, uh, it's like a predecessor uh, to the Trump, uh, to a trombone. It was, uh, and, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't even, that, but you could change notes, um, you could glide, you could do glissando. So on top of the keyboard, you could play one note at a time, but there's a ribbon controller all the way across. So you'd push down on the key and you wiggle the key to get vibrato. You could push it up and down with a force sensor like aftertouch when MIDI came out. MIDI wasn't available yet when this photograph was taken. And you could slide your finger up onto above the keyboard and then slide to the next note and then drop down and hit that note and hit that. So you could actually make sleeves. Um, so basically you could make smooth transitions uh, between the keyboard gives you random access to a discrete set of ordered tones, but you could actually slide glissando between the two by just going up and coming down like a trombone or a violin, as opposed to a, a normal keyboard. It's, it was, and, and, and it had this left-hand controller here that let you use like voice formats to actually get the various sounds. And that was very early that you use your non-dominant hand for uh, like a game controller to change the timbre dynamically while well, you could actually get the, include it and then you get the tremolo and vibrato and the glissandos with the right hand on the monocline. It was, it was just a remarkable instrument. There were three of them made of this version. There was some earlier prototypes and I was lucky this is the orange one. And this is a Cynthia AKS that came from, yeah, it was also called the Putney. This is an earlier version up there. Behind me, there's a whole rack of rack mount equipment too, but uh, it was, it was fairly interesting. Um, none of these things stayed in tune. Um, and they were largely, uh, this one could be used on stage. And that's what I liked about it. And at that time, the way as a musician, electronic music in the 60s and 70s, if you were doing that, um, the great art act of live performance was to uh, record stuff on a reel to reel tape recorder, take the tape recorder to the concert hall, hook it up to a mixer to the speakers, and then you could be this great artist and mix this stuff uh, uh, from stereo <laughs> and to the EQ in the room. And that was a, that was your performance. And that didn't quite seem to me as an instrumentalist uh, adequate. And this is the what drove the desire. And this instrument there and that guy, by meeting him because he did was just down the hall. Uh, he helped invent radar, and so they let him play with stuff up at NRC, which is where the computer music system was and the computer animation system was, and um, and that's where I learned about capacitive touch and its importance and relevance to music and other things, and that's what led them. And that's so this, it's talking about standing on the shoulders of giants, Hewlett Kane, that's whose shoulders I was standing on, that brought the capacitive multi-touch, and then this guy from. Delaware stood on our shoulders, and then the Apple uh, ran with it. Um, and but there was a guy at Bell Labs who had done it uh, better than I did at the same time independently. It, it's just uh, we all just contributed. That's all, and uh, and everybody riffed on everybody else. But the negative side of this is why I started building the digital synthesizer that you 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 saw, because it was one of the first portable digital music instruments that was fully digital. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat from Hans, uh, who says, I've been involved in numerous debates between mentors and students on the efficacy of manual sketching with pencil and paper versus computer sketching. Given Bill's experience with computers to generate music, what's his take on hand versus computer sketching? So can I extend that and say, and the same thing is true because I used to be on the board of the Canadian Film Center where um, they uh, used film and movie cameras and, and so on. And, uh, and, when, and when Norman Jewison, you know, I talked to him, it's all about storytelling. And, and I came in and started talking about how the digital side of things there. I have a rule and the, and what, and what the, here's the, how I can give you some tools to answer those debates and put them in their place. And I don't mean to shut them down, but to basically bring some context. The rule is this, I've said it already. 
Everything is best for something and worse for something else. And the wise person is the one who knows the when, where, why, and how to use each appropriately and when not to, and when to transmit from one to the other. They all have their place. Digital never replaced anything. They just, and technology never did. Um, think about paper versus uh, computer sketching. Think about now live theater, then to cinema, then to television, then to games, then to streaming. All of those stages still have a place in the market. None destroyed the other unless they were, didn't have any value. They just changed, narrowed the market, and, and, and but brought in more users. So the size of the market became larger. More people are watching more theater, so to speak, whether it's on any of those media, but none of them were replaced. Same thing here. Um, I have huge respect for working with paper. I do it all the time. My look, uh, um, I have uh, post-it notes stuck all over my desk. I have, I have, but I have, I have three pen-based computers. I have, I, I have all, all this stuff. I use them differently. And it's like the violin doesn't replace the cello, and the cello doesn't replace um, the viola. And it, that doesn't replace the contrabass. They're all in the violin family, and none of them replace anything else in the orchestra. And if you're Lighthouse, you had them in the band and toured with a rock band with, with 13 people. Um, and so the question is, don't not one's better, but when would you use one versus the other? And 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 I would say that uh, for a lot of my work, uh, the The question is, what's more important, the way you render, the materials you render, or how you share it? It depends who's working. If I'm working with people that are um, in, um, in China, in a different time zone, or, or in India, uh, I'm probably going to use electronic sketching because I can fire it. But I would argue that probably if the tools I make for digital drawing and, and, are draw and sketching aren't don't bring something better or different or some real value to paper, then paper's way cheaper. It feels better. And, um, and so what I would be doing typically and how I approach things is I sort of say, well, I'm not gonna try and copy paper. I'm gonna try and capture the skills. So any skills you have in working with paper and with watercolor, my wife's a professional artist. I, I, I confronted this. When I design a paint system, uh, which there was, uh, every car in the world is designed with a, a paint system that came out of uh, my, and if you've ever used something called Sketchbook Pro on um, the Adobe cells now, that, that's, that was my product and, um, back in 2000, I think it was. But the, but the, key, the key thing is, um, the, the key thing is, it's just a question of when. It's just like, is cam are cameras better for capturing a landscape than, than watercolors? Or, or, and, and by the way, no, watercolors suck. Why not use oil? No, no, I should use acrylic. This would be very clear. Come back to film versus digital. Are you trying to tell me that lead and, and oil and pigments are a, a more holy technology than, than, than electrons? Electronic musical instruments versus mechanical, electroacoustic versus mechanical acoustics. They're both machines. The pencil is a machine. So they're all technologies. So now let's get rid of the biases of what is the favorite. It's which is the most appropriate and how do they work together? And why should I be forced to make a choice? And, and, uh, and how can I have the skills from one going to the other? Because the last thing I want to do is uh, get rid of canvas and paper, but I'd sure like to extend the speed with which. The key thing is if you have a really good watercolor thing, what I look at in watercolor, um, you get almost perfection. You've gotten almost a perfect thing. You want to try something, and you are afraid that if you do it, you'll ruin the whole. And and so that gives you a chance for experimentation. So quick, dirty stuff. I might um, I might switch to I might switch to digital. But uh, what I'd say is the introducing of markers completely changed industrial design and how they, the process. Just that from other drawing tools on paper. Forget digital, that, that, that technology. That was, a, that was a landmark change if you know anybody in industrial design. And, uh, 
And even if you look at how fussy we are in terms of our fine point pens uh, for fine drawing and architecture, um, it, it's, um, it just depends. Why do we love these things? Figure out what the properties are, and then you can see how to make better tools, even whether they're digital or not. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Hans, for the question. Does uh, anybody else, I'm keeping an eye on the chat, if anybody wants to type in a question, or does anybody want to unmute and ask Bill a question? I don't bite, and I can't. I'm remote. Otherwise, I might bite. But I'm not going <laughs> to jump out of the audience and smack you in the face either. Just, just while we're waiting for another question, I have to, I have to add a comment. In, and this is a, a little bit about the nature of, of, of sorry, yeah. oh, sorry, terrific. Go ahead, please. I did have a really um, hi, Bill. Thanks for your talk. Um, great to great to hear your perspectives on design and drawing and all those things. Um, working as an engineer within the faculty here, um, I just a really um, basic question about the media that you prefer to use is do you have favorite pens or pencils or paper types or um that you 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 go to yeah um so you know i i i right now i i tend to use a mixture but my favorite because i i'm pencil challenged i my son and my wife can just draw without even hatching. They just have complete confidence aligned and it pisses me off that anybody can do that, but I'm jealous, but in a, but also so full of admiration. So I find that um, I, I, I can work better with uh, something that's very fine tipped and, and sensitive, I, but I also have a mixture of things depending on what, what, I'm, what I'm drawing. So I, I surround myself with different tools. The, the styluses I use on computers, I've worked uh, on on these things. This one is uh, from Wacom, who's, which uh, is one of the first companies I visited when I went to Alias to to talk to them about the design of pens, but where they can actually sense tilt and pressure. And um, uh, so you can actually get fine, beautiful, uh, and, and, and you can control different things. So they, they have different sensitivities, but it's the question of finesse. What's a worthy tool? You spend mm -hmm. so many so much time learning to have this beautiful craft and then somebody gives you this, it's like the, a lot of computer paint programs are like, you've got these beautiful skills you've worked through your whole life in high school, you were the best drawer in the class on paper. And then they give you this thing, it's, it's worse than a crayon. It's like uh, trying to draw yeah. with your fist. And it's just like, I, here's, here's why I think where Doug and I sort of cross paths and I, I don't know whether he would articulate it this way but 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 this holds true with artists too that there is no profession because I'm a biased as a musician there's no profession that has a longer history of expressing powerful creative ideas through a technological intermediary than musicians weapons don't count and and therefore I often uh, in Europe, when I had to uh, sign hotel registers showing your profession, I would write luthier, which is uh, the French word for lute builder, which has become the generic name for a musical instrument uh, designer and builder. And the and the properties, all the properties that I would say a musical instrument and a digital musical instrument, just as a digital pen or paint program, the measure, my measure of a good design is, is it worth practicing? Can I improve? And does it make me stupid so I lose my skills and it just tries to do it for me? No, I want to be able to express everything where I'm in control. And if it makes me better, that's fine. But, but, but in a sense, and then I, the skills I use when I work on the digital will transfer when I go back to paper because I'm not going to get rid of um, either. And the same thing, I'm not going to get rid of my conventional instruments. So I got to throw in my saxophone because I, I've got a, a synthesizer. And, but the most important thing to respect is the human skill, not the thing that enables it. It's just a mediator and it has to be analog. And all of this stuff is digital and it switches and as opposed to flows. The reason the iPhone killed Microsoft's phone business isn't because it had a multi-touch. It wasn't because of icons. It wasn't because of touch screens. All of that stuff had existed before with existing products. Again, if you've gone back and do the history like I have, I can illustrate everything I'm saying. It was because it was the first digital device at the consumer level that had an analog interface. 
It animated, things flowed, they had shape, they had dynamics and had physics. And, and by the way, they were terrible at it. But relative to the time when it came out, it was a night and day. And you just felt, ah, this feels like normal. Mm-hmm. And so here's my, here's the thing about design. Everybody thinks that they design features as opposed to products and they don't think about design languages. So here's, here's my, my favorite riddle. Um, um, what do Canadian and transitions have in common? What do Canadians and transitions have in common? This is a bit of a geeky joke. They're both dominated by the states in the sense of when you do a storyboard or state transition diagram, we'd spend all our time in the circles and then just draw a line of an arrow connecting them. The magic that got the iPhone where it is, is they spent their time on the arrows. And if you look at any book on storyboarding, most of them aren't about story, storyboarding, but there's one book on um, for directors and I've worked in Hollywood and I can just tell you, if you look at any storyboard worth its salt, it's full of arrows. There's a huge vocabulary of arrows. There's annotations and the arrows will work within the frame and between the frames. And there's a lot of text because it's all about the transitions. It's all about the flow. And what we're trying to do is make it analog, make things flow. Um, Every single thing we do with every product is a compound task. And if you have to go step, interruption, step, interruption, for all the micro steps, there's an interruption to get from the next step to the next step to the next step. That takes cognitive load to be able to do the planning, skill to remember the order so you don't make a semantic error, and, and then and there's this, 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 this horrible feeling. But when you just go like that, it's, it flows. And so flow, it, it, there's this whole part about flow and the cycle. That's, that's, that's fine too. But I just mean uninterrupted, no speed bumps. What's the activity? How do you treat it as a whole? And, and all of my design is that because it's exactly like music. I've got notes. I've got changes in the articulation, vibrato, stuff like that but I'm just playing the phrase and I want you to hear the phrase. Everything else is just amplifying the phrase, but I'm focused on the microstructure, not the macro because it's poorly designed. And that's, that's the case. Nearly every paint program only lets you use one hand. You cannot draw without reto- rotating the work and so on and so forth with the other hand when you're working with paper. There's, 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 there's no, no computer system that lets you do that. Fundamentally, I've done videotapes of people sketching and we know biomechanically you can draw better pulling than pushing vertically, but but it's less facile when you're going left to right. And so you'll rotate depending on the fine and all these types of things. There's all these things about the biomechanics. And so the, it isn't about paper, it's about the fit to the human. And the paper and our practice on paper have evolved to fit the human, whereas the computers take the superficial thing and every piece of paper is nailed to the table. You can't change your orientation and you can't hold a palette in your other hand. You have to go up and take your brush way over here. You know, it's, it's like if you go to the Rijksmuseum and look at the night watch, you do not see it full of holes where Rembrandt nailed his palette onto the, onto the canvas so they could do that. And, 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 and it was covering up. He could just pull it away and, and, and uh, all those types of actions. I study the human. I, uh, the, the technology I care about is the human. And then I try to find the, the, the way to mediate that, that, that those natural skills, as opposed to saying, here, let me fit you to that. This is the perfect, because I'm a genius. I know how to do engineering software. And the part is when I come up to engineers, whether they're structural engineers or, or electrical or mechanical engineers, the, um, the, the key thing is they actually get it and we can find the common language. And the, and the, the problem is, is that we speak very different languages and, um, and I'll just tell you one other thing, as a designer working in a high tech company, I'm actually a translator because for some fluke, I, I ended up because I was in a computer artist in residence in a computer science department, I, 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 I'm bilingual. I can speak engineer, 
that I can speak uh, design. And so this is my biggest tip with social things about when you are trying to get out with others. Because when I came to Microsoft, people said, those stupid designers, they have their head in the clouds, they can't do a thing, they're useless and stuff like that, they're idiots, they won't listen to anything, and they're just all going off with this stuff, they're a bunch of hippies. And the designers think those engineers, they're so anal retentive, they just have no imagination, they're so stuck on their things. And, and it's like, no, no, there's not a single stupid person there. There's, I have never met a stupid person. I've, ne I've never met anybody who wasn't highly motivated. They're, but there's such cultural differences, but you don't see the differences. They all go to the same universities, drink the same beer, cheer for the same hockey team and stuff like that. And all of a sudden they come to work, they're, they're just like, like oil and, bit, uh, and water. So the thing is this, you can leverage this. Remember I said about the critique, this is where it's really valuable. And this is where it gets in danger when you've got people with an engineering and science technology background versus working with people with a design background, especially from architecture where crit is really important. And this is, People in the arts background show how good they are by how they can make art or create great things out of anything. Give me anything and I can, I can do make music with it. That's my pride. The analytic, I'm being you know, bifurcating in, a, in an exaggerated way. They're, they prove how smart they are by spotting the holes, where the weaknesses are, where it's gonna fail, why it can't do this, it can't do that. And so one side sees the other as fully negative. No one sees a bunch, of, about, a bunch of hippie optimists who are not grounded in reality. And the fact is, if you take Kranzberg's first law, if he's best for something or worse for something else, if you mediate this through appropriate critique, following the rules, no rejection or, advocate, or advocating for rejection or acceptance, just enumerate the strengths and weaknesses and get them all up on the table without rancor and without... Uh, and, judge, and just making objective judges with a design rationale, explicit design rationale for that judgment. Then you step back and say, oh, we were both right, but we approached the problem from different sides, but we're on the same team. And those types of social mediations, I spend really a lot of my time and I'll just say, hey, stop. Um, here's what I heard you say. Uh, here's what I think you said. And here's what I think you understood. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and, and then, but here's what he was meant. Is that what you meant? Yes, yes, okay. And they were arguing about to tear each other's throats up when they were actually agreeing on, they actually agreed on the same thing. They just didn't know how to communicate. And those are the types of skills that that's where I talk about the importance of literacy. You have to understand that and be able to use references. When I'm dealing with a, somebody from engineering or from business, I wanna know who their heroes are, who are the stars and, re, and be literate on that side so I can try and explain things in their vocabulary. I, and I and here's the other rule. If I want them to understand design, I think he, they don't understand anything about design. They're a bunch of idiots that can't read the design. They make all these stupid comments. Ask yourself, do I know as much about what they do, how they're evaluated, what they aspire to, and the nature of their work and how they're about everything as I expect them to have of mine? And if I don't, shut up and go learn. Take them out. Talk to them forever about what they do and stuff like that. And at a certain point, they'll be so embarrassed that it's all about them. They'll say, oh, what do you do? And then they'll ask as opposed to you trying to push it. And there's all these ways to social engineer these things when you are working in this diverse, heterogeneous team. But by definition, a Renaissance team is heterogeneous in terms of skills and cultures. And the key thing that holds it together is that openness and this willingness to actually learn to uh, understand each other's references. Who are the great people? You know, if you're talking about advertising, just start talking about Bill Bernbach or something like that um, and so on. And, and, uh, and, 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 and all of a sudden things will change and, and, and people start asking you for advice about your field and, and for their problems and back and forth. And then you know you've made it when each other asking um, people from other disciplines um, for advice on your own discipline. Within the design process. Could I could I ask you before uh, we go on to the next question? You were about to mention a book um, about story, a different kind of storyboarding about the transitions. I think from a director's point of view. Yes, um, I I'm gonna have to. I can't pull it off the top of my head. Um, okay. But I it, it just ping me and I'll, I'll you can you can spread it out. But it, the book is called Shot by Shot. Okay. And it's got a blue cover, and it's a uh, it's a book from quite a while ago. But it's 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 um it's 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 a it, it it's really good. And, and it actually, the guy who's worked in Hollywood, and he's, he's taking 
do an analysis, but especially how you plan the shots. But I've I've worked in been in sessions on, on feature films with you know, um, uh, and 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 I, I got to tell you that I I, I worked. Um, I worked when you know, so, so I was working with the head of production for Lucasfilm and, and places like that, and, and and the and in filmmaking they sketch. Uh, George Lucas, man, I I saw the complete. Um, in this case, it was the fourth episode, the the one of the pod racers scenes in that. Um, and I, I probably have clips on my computer so I could show you, but I saw that completed film before they even started principal photography. They start um, just with animatics and they just have these little, they'll have just paper sketches stuck in and they'll put them in the film. They're just standing there static and the music will be starting to come in and they'll have a pacing and Disney started this whole thing. You start with a finished film. It's just um, 90 minutes of leader. And then you start splicing stuff in. And, and just adding and, and, re, and gradually refine the detail you're editing. And so you get the pacing and you, and you just have uh, key shots. It's like what we use in design for mood boards. We just stick them up and uh, look at that. You have all this stuff. It's the same process. And it, and, and it gradually comes out. Um, and, and, and in uh, the earlier ones, when you saw the starfighters going, no, no, he just went and got uh, World War I biplane dogfight footage, like documentary, and rotoscoped it. And then replace the uh, the stuff in the film with with uh, just uh, 3D models or, or even by hand animated stuff by, by keyframe, and but but use that as the motion capture system to get the dynamics right and the the whole flow, and the, you're just watching World War One dogfights when you see those those things going on. That's that's where it came from. He sampled the world. He didn't synthesize that. And that's where the vocabulary came, and you don't see it, and and. Uh, and, and, and talking about materials, in the pod racing scenes, when these guys are going around, if you know this film, those pod racers, none of, when they crashed, there was no animation there at all. They used our software and they used the physics embedded in it. So they designed, they spent a fortune designing the mechanicals and how they, of those devices, they, they stole some really good car designers in major uh, studios. And when they crashed, they just crashed them into hard materials and they let it physics go. Then they tweaked the rules of physics to exaggerate because it's a movie. But at the same time, you have the most expensive 3D graphics that's probably ever been done up to that point. In the crowd scene, the synthesians, because they weren't people, were Q-tips dipped in paint in the same frame. And they realized that the directors, their job is to direct your eye, not to direct the film. And, and so talking about materials, um, James Cameron would have like full 3D models walk on the deck of the Titanic when you got the shot from way far away that you had to render really expensive, Q-tips would have worked. Very, very different approaches to how to use technology and understanding where, what the purposes are and what the costs are. And, and so uh, my, my characterization of George Lucas is, uh, He's the cheapest, uh, he's cheapest uh, person in Hollywood. And now, you, Doug, this is where you say, "Well, how cheap was he, Bill?" <laughs> he's so cheap. George Lucas is so cheap; he'll spare no expense to save money. And in a sense, that's what we need to do in terms of our interactions with management. No, we're not expensive. If you invest up front. When the team, the burn rate is low, and we can actually do our jobs better because we've got the right staff and the right teams, we're not going to be late. We're going to be early on delivery, and the product is going to be tested. It's going to be reliable. We'll never be 100% in terms of successful, but you'll find out sooner, and it'll cost you less, and the, and the percentages will be far higher, and that we can demonstrate. And all of this can be taught. It's there's no magic. Um, and and um, and trying to you know and Voltaire said it right. Uh, perfect is the enemy of the good. Just be able to do good work, and every once in a while to do brilliant work. 
but good's got to be good enough because there's a lot of bad stuff. And here's the one last reason about this, where I got to go, so let's get another meeting, is this. Whatever you think, I can never get my product to market or I can't be successful. Look at the crappy products that are out there and what kind of bozos must have done them. How could they, somebody who you would be contemptuous of in terms of the quality of the work, instead of being critical to say, my God, if they could get that to market, what's wrong with me that I can't get a really good idea to market? What do they know that I don't know? Because they're not that stupid. They just are bad designers or to have a bad product. And so go find out, look, in the, look at the failures. Don't just look at the successes because um, almost every product that's a huge success has had an earlier version that was a total failure. Oh, by the way, to emphasize that, I'll just give you one example. The iPhone is maybe the most successful computer, you know, digital gadget in, in history from a financial perspective. Johnny Ive was the lead designer in that. Do you know what his, he was hired, what product he was hired to do when he went to Apple? The second generation of the Newton, one of the biggest disasters. And if you hold up a Newton beside an iPhone, you'll realize they're essentially the same product. They're handheld touchscreen uh, PDA devices. Um, and and um, he uh, was not a famous guy in those days. He was a really good designer. But we only see the successes. We don't see where it came from. We don't see the connection. And by the way, the iPhone uh, came, the, that PDA, that uh, Palm 2, sorry, the, uh, not Palm 2, the, the second generation Newton, came out around the same time as uh, IBM came out with the Simon smartphone, which is in 1963, was the, was the first phone, which is a full smartphone with a touchscreen with icons, the pen and all, all the sort of stuff, graphics. And it was an iPhone. If I described it to you, you'd say, the, you just described the iPhone. And that was um, way earlier, but it was around the same time Johnny Ives said. And he, that, he knew that phone absolutely. And he put that together with the Newton stuff, and with the changes in technology, figured the tra trajectories on the long nose and said, okay, this is when these things are gonna mature. This is where we're gonna do it. And he convinced Jobs, Jobs saw the vision to do it and gave it and they, and, and they won. And, uh, and the rest is history. Um, but those, this is what I talk about the history. Look at the case studies, just like you pretend you're in business school, pretend you're in law, do the case studies and, 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 do, and do the history. Um, I know you have to leave us, Bill, but I have yeah. to just make a final comment based on this this picture because um, the the for those who who don't know, the National Research Council of Canada did extraordinary things about the time this picture was taken, not just in um, music synthesizers, but also in animation, and it gave Canada for a little while really a leg up in both of these areas. And part of it was because it was so open. So I, Bill was in a, in a famous Canadian band called Lighthouse, but I also had occasion to talk to Paul Hofford, who was in the same band. He told me that he was driving through Ottawa one day. He went by a building called the National Research Council. He thought that sounded interesting. He, he walked into the building. He told them what he did. And they said, that sounds interesting. Would you like to be a research associate? And one of the things as we move forward with research and we talk about these ideas and bringing them to fruition is the idea that we really need to open the doors to a lot of different points of view in research. Canada sadly has closed it all down. Now you need a, a PhD and, and 16 million papers to get that research grant, but it didn't used to be like that. And it actually gave us a, an incredible leg up in terms of innovation in two critical areas. Yeah. So, oh, so can I get uh, two, two, three really quick things and then we go, so I'll give you a pointer. On my webpage, uh, billbuxton.com, and by the way, Shoemaker's Child, my webpage is so bad, it's it's, it's embarrassing. Um, uh, I don't know what to say about that. I should lose all credibility. But the on the papers page, there's a fun an essay called The Folly of Research Funding in Canada, and it speaks to the National Research Council. So one, um, I knew Lighthouse, I knew Paul, he's a really close friend. Um, we've done tons of things together. I wasn't in the band. I was in, I had 
a different group, but the, but um, but I've sure been in recording sessions and stuff uh, with them. They're, they're, and so and and but our show, our stories are similar. And to put on the ground, I used to ride my motorcycle up from Queens as an undergraduate uh, in the music you know composition theory program at Queens. I'd ride up there, and I got to use the computer from six o'clock in the evening till six o'clock in the morning, and then I go back down to Kingston. And, and, and sometimes I'd stay overnight and to do film soundtrack. I'd never seen a computer before. I had two hours instruction and then they gave me the, they just gave me the run of the place and that I could work on my own with only two hours to do a thing. Oh, this computer graphics. And this is in 1971. That's the same stuff that Paul was working on. That's, and that's one place where we, we overlap very much. But who was working in the mornings? from six in the morning till six at night. It was a guy named Peter Fuldes. And he did a classic film on the NFB. If you go to their site, it's called Hunger. That is where, and, the, and there's these two, Nestor Burtnick and Marcelli Wine, who were there. Um, they built that animation system. They won an Academy Award for it, for tech, scientific and technical achievement. Um, and, and, and Bill Reeves, who was uh, with John Lasseter, did, uh, got the Academy Awards to Toy Story. Bill Reeves got that's the, that his skills came out of there. My share in Academy Award for scientific for Maya and stuff like that came um, came out of that, that. It comes out of that experience. But very clear, Pierre was there doing that film using exactly the same computer and the same tools, but in, on a different medium. While I was doing uh, my music stuff, and and it was spectacular. And and the worst thing that happened is they started to change it to say, you have to provide um, a business case and get business sponsorship. And this notion of, of curiosity driven research and the entire Canadian placement in things like Teledon, digital media, video production, um, filmmaking, all of that huge came with huge, owes a huge debt to that experience. And on a couple of universities that were doing uh, open up to, to do things to let people like me come in and just take over the computer systems to, to do music stuff. Um, and those doors got closed in the interest of, of innovation. And what they did is in the process, they stifled the innovation and, um, and, and, it, uh, and, and hence uh, a lot of us have not been able to have a career in Canada. Uh, we've had to go elsewhere to, to be, work, meet our potential. And, um, and it's, these are things you got to deal with. And, um, but I think the tide is changing because people are recognizing now that the importance of design and, and if those changes are happening, it's places like NRC that planted the seeds of some of us who are now senior enough that we can actually uh, have a, a larger voice to try and bring about the change. But that's also why I do stuff like this because I, it's really important that um, people, uh, as I say, take the risk because it's way more dangerous to not take the risk and go for it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, thank you everybody for, for uh, staying with us today. Um, and uh, just a quick plug, um, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but Veronica on April 23rd, we'll be having the, the mentorship mixer. So um, stay tuned for that as well. And thank you very much everybody for participating. And, and, and please, you. Please uh, tell me about this, this sketching workshop and, and the stuff that was on just when I was arrived. So we can have that offline, but um, down the road, because I'm not aware of that. And I'm, I'm sh shocked that I, I, there's such, something like that that I don't know about. And uh, all the reason more to reach out and touch base with other people, we're learning something all the time. Definitely. I'll send you a kind of a, a summary of what we did and, and why it's why it's kind of interesting and important and some links to the mural board. Uh, all the mural board stuff is is absolutely open to people so we can get that out to you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, you may know about service hub and stuff like that. And, 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 and uh, if you don't know my stuff on the portfolio wall, which I think relates directly to that, um, I'll, I'll send you that those videos too. Okay. That'd Wonderful. Great. We could add that into the mural board. Oh yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'd love to try it. I, I, I have, let's put it this way. I have access to, uh, you know, we make 90, uh, you know, 84 inch uh, wall mounted and, and no, no, it's, I, it's especially if remote work, if we can't work on the same surface interactively with, with seeing each other and working together, 
And if you want to have a separate conversation, I fill you in if you want to talk about this stuff um, uh, as in a separate conversation. Uh, uh, I, I would love to learn about this and, and just, just let me know whenever you can. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, given that we, you know, we're a virtual university and we are, uh, we are doing uh, design studios almost every day of the week online with people around the world. Uh, we would be, this would be a wonderful uh, thing to talk about. And if you're doing that and you have really good people, um, my interns are, our interns are not virtual. They're real. And we're looking for ones that have this kind of background. Always. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Maybe we could also uh, twist your arm or one of your, or somebody you work with to be part of the mentoring mixer as well, because the students have really expressed an interest to be more cross-disciplinary. It's, it's possible. So um, that's a conversation I'm open to. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay. All Fantastic. Right. Thanks, Thanks for asking. And see you, everybody. And thanks for your patience. And uh, I hope this is helpful. Just Thank you very just, much, everybody. Just go for it. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.